Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Tracy Newman, and I'll be moderating today's event. I am a pediatrician, the health officer for the City of Fargo, and medical director at Fargo Cast Public Health. At NDSU, I'm an associate professor of practice in the Department of Public Health and associate director of Siri. Today, I have the great honor to introduce Dr. Caitlin Jettelina, who will be presenting this webinar titled From Elimination to Resurgence, The Challenges of Controlling Vaccine Preventable Disease in a Changing World. Dr. Caitlin Jettelina is an epidemiologist and scientific communicator. She co-founded the Health Trust Initiative and is a senior scientific advisor to several governmental and nonprofit agencies, including formerly at the White House and currently at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Resolve to Save Lives. In addition, Dr. Jettelina is the publisher of Your Local Epidemiologist, a public health newsletter that translates ever-evolving science to the public with over 300 million views. Dr. Jettelina has received numerous national awards, including a National Academies of Science Award and a Medal of Honor from the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Caitlin resides with her husband and two toddlers in San Diego, California. This webinar is being recorded. A publicly accessible recording will be available on NDSU series YouTube page following the presentation. For those seeking one credit of CE, please follow the link available in the webinar chat to take the pretest. There will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. Please type your questions during the presentation into the Q&A feature of the Zoom platform. If you prefer to email them anonymously, please email ndsu.cire at ndsu.edu. Dr. Jettelina, thank you so much for joining us. You may begin. Great, thanks for having me and good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are right now. I'm very excited to be here and I've been looking forward to this presentation because quite frankly, it doesn't have to do with COVID, uh, but it does have to do with something uh, very important. Uh, and so I'm gonna go over the challenges I think that we will be facing and are facing of controlling vaccine preventable diseases in this very much changing world. Of public health. So, okay. Um, so I don't think I have to tell this group that by far the biggest public health achievement in the history of in the history of public health is vaccines. Um, I think a historical viewpoint is incredibly important when talking about vaccine preventable diseases, uh, and I really wanted a level set with that today first that we're not seeing cases like we did in the early to mid 1900s. And this is because of vaccines. We see pretty dramatic graphs showing the reduction of burden across really all vaccine preventable diseases that we've had great success with, including polio and whipping cough, as well as measles. But we are starting to see peppered throughout the news that vaccine preventable diseases are coming back. Uh, in July 2022, for example, the United States witnessed their first polio case after three decades of eradication, and this ended up leaving a 21-year-old paralyzed. Now, it is possible, and I do want to provide space in that, yeah, maybe people are just more hyper-aware of disease and infectious diseases after COVID-19 emergency, but we are also seeing these uh, re re uh, resurgence among the epi graphs as well. So for example, here is a graph of whooping cough. As you can see in the 1970s, the annual incidence was fewer than 5,000 cases per year. And this started creeping up pretty slowly in the 2000s and then mid 2000s to current day we reached a peak of more than 45 cases per year. Um, and like a lot of other diseases, and you'll see in all of these graphs that the pandemic really put a lid on these uh, because we were staying at home. Um, but last year, whipping cough started upticking again, for example. The same story is with measles in the United States over time. So for example, more than 600 cases per year uh, in the 1960s to almost nil now. But I think it's important that even though this graph doesn't really show that we have had histograms uh, the past you know, 20, 30 years, it's not zero, right? It's not unusual for us to see a measles case here and there. Cases typically pop up because of international travelers. 
Uh, however, uh, over the past 10 years, there has been a steady rise. So if we do a data pull out for the cases since 2000, we are seeing an increase in measles cases. Um, and interestingly, our last bad measles year, if you want to call it that, was in 2019, where we had more than 1,200 cases and actually almost lost our elimination status in the United States. The 2019 outbreak was actually, was many different outbreaks, but there was one huge outbreak in New York uh, among a Jewish Orthodox community. Before that, our last big outbreak was in 2014 to 2015 uh, due to a Disneyland outbreak in, in California. I'll highlight the data in 2024 so far that we're seeing, but there's a few reasons us epidemiologists are a bit nervous about 2024. First, I think that uh, you should recognize that there is, it is normal to have a flare up of measles every five years. This is typical for this disease. It's um, cyclical. And it happened, 2024 happens to be uh, five years since our last outbreak, so in 2019. The second reason we're paying attention about what happens to measles is that because it's so contagious, it's really the first block to fall with vaccine preventable diseases, right? The herd immunity threshold is really high, 95%. So if we're gonna start seeing ourselves moving backwards, it's gonna be with measles um, in, in the short term at least. And like I said, measles in 2024 is coming in hot, um, not necessarily because of the number of cases, but rather because of the number of outbreaks we're seeing. Uh, we are simply seeing more sparks, more embers. And the more embers we have, the more likelihood those embers are gonna find an unvaccinated pocket and spread like wildfire. And there are unvaccinated pockets, right? So here are um, the states based on MMR vaccination coverage. And we have about 30 to 35 states that are under the 95% threshold needed for herd immunity. Um, now, for example, I think I have North Dakota. Yeah, North Dakota is in there. I think it's about 92%. And 92% seems high. It is high, right? But uh, again, still under the herd immunity threshold. So that means that because measles, because we're under that, we're just going to start seeing these um, outbreaks occur. And they are happen to be occurring in these states with um, under this herd immunity threshold. But it's not just MMR. Uh, in 2022, which was our latest data, more than 250,000 kindergartners are not up to date on their routine vaccines. Uh, so for example, I pulled some particular states here, right? So the herd immunity threshold is about 95%. Uh, the United States is at 93%. I highlighted North Dakota here, which is 92%. And one of the worst states with routine vaccination rates is Idaho with an 81% uh, MMR vaccination rate. But it's not just MMR, right? We're seeing this with DTaP, we're seeing this with polio, we're seeing this with other vaccines. And so for example, with polio, where we need about an 80% herd immunity threshold, we're getting very close uh, to this in certain states um, like Alaska and Idaho. We're also starting to see inequities, uh, or not starting, we're seeing inequities. Um, for example, we're seeing this most easily with the flu data, with COVID-19 data, uh, which is reflective of routine vaccinations. For example, Black adults, and those with income less than 40,000, and those with a high school education are less likely to get their vaccines than those that don't. We're also seeing a significant disparities in urbanicity. So for example, with flu vaccines and coverage among kids, we're seeing that although urban and suburban are keeping pretty steady on flu vaccination rates, rural, rural areas have uh, significantly declined in vaccination rates. Again, this is flu, but pretty reflective of our routine vaccinations as well. So we're seeing a slow but steady burn of a resurgence of, of vaccine preventable diseases. And I think one of the biggest questions 
a lot of people have right now is why. And honestly, this is a billion dollar question um, because the reality is that it's messy and there are a myriad of factors. And I'll, I'll try and walk through some of these factors and why I think they're important. And most importantly, what we can do about it. So first reason I think that we're seeing a resurgence in vaccine preventable diseases is that our information landscape is changing and it's changing very dramatically. Uh, people no longer get their information from newspapers. In fact, only 30% of Americans trust in the news overall. We have social media. It's a huge part of how people get their news and the greatest source of health information worldwide. Over 70% of Americans search the internet for healthcare related information. And this is again, different across different socio demographics. For example, among rural adults, one in two rural adults use social media for healthcare related information. So to me, this highlights where we need to be at on social media and I'll get there in a little. The challenge with social media is the way that information is spread through echo chambers. Uh, what drives becoming viral is emotions. And so misinformation or conspiracy theories or false news thrives on this environment. A study by MIT found that false news uh, and misinformation goes farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth. They found that, uh, that false news reached far more people than the truth, that it was more retweeted by the, than the truth. It was spread through peer-to-peer -peer, um, interaction more than the truth. False news was six times faster at spreading than the truth. It was retweeted by more unique users and it's diffused more broadly. And so I think that these findings shed a new light on the fundamental aspects of our online communication ecosystem. And I think it's really important to highlight that this study was done in 2018. So even before this pandemic, which has uh, changed a lot um, in our landscape. And this is directly impacting behaviors like getting vaccinated. A recent Annenberg report showed that or asked Americans whether certain statements of vaccines were true. They asked this in 2021 and then in also in 2023. And they found a consistent theme that there was a growing acceptance of vaccine misinformation. For example, one in eight people believe there are toxins like antifreeze in our vaccines. Um, and so again, this doesn't just this didn't just lead into COVID-19, but certainly bled into other vaccines as well. So our information landscape is changing. I think it's really important also to recognize that during the pandemic, there was significant vaccine disruptions. So at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of pe pediatric patients uh, didn't go to their routine healthcare visits because they were staying at home. And we're still trying to catch up from that. So there's this JAMA study that found the rates of weekly declined uh, uh, vaccination rates uh, during the pandemic. Um, and the most dramatic part was among children aged four to six years old. And so these are um, the weekly rates of vaccination or visits uh, over time among uh, children. And they found that there has been a gradual return to pre-pandemic times for some age groups, but certainly not all. And this is actually a global phenomenon too. So we've seen vaccine disruptions on a global level. So this is measles cases um, over time. And from 20, we saw, saw a very big decline in measles incidents uh, during the pandemic. But then from 2021 to 2022, we saw an incidence increase by 19% and deaths increased by 45%. Now, of course, this matters um, because what happens in the Eastern Mediterranean, for example, impacts us very quickly in the United States because of globalization. Um, and so with measles, for example, this means we're just gonna get a whole lot more travel related cases of measles, um, more embers uh, that are able to find more pockets. Third reason that I think that we've seen a resurgence, and this is actually what I'm most concerned about moving forward, is this lack of institutional trust. And this isn't, 
just a problem in public health, right? It's a public problem across a lot of domains in the United States society. But of oh, okay, recording. Okay. Um, but I, of course, I'm hyper focused on what this means for vaccines. I think this is especially important to talk about on the heels of the pandemic, where this was public health's biggest test, in which we actually we pretty we failed in a lot of ways, and we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, a lot of people look to the federal government. However, there was very confusing guidance. There was lack of communication and plain language, and of course, that there's politics in play as well. Academia was a huge partner during the pandemic, but they're also very difficult to understand. And unfortunately, academia is pretty darn slow during an emergency. And then of course, there was for profit during the pandemic. A lot of people think they have lost objectivity, particularly the media. And uh, there's partisanship. And there's of course, conflicts of interest with uh, for profit companies like um, uh, vaccine manufacturers. And so together during the pandemic, a lot of people just couldn't find answers to their questions, couple this with mistakes made, and it really bred confusion, anxiety, and a lot of groups would just throw up their arms and uh, stop paying attention altogether. And we've seen these mistakes really play out in the numbers. This is a survey from Pew, uh, which asked Americans um, how much confidence they have in scientists uh, to act in the best interests of the public. And it's declined since 2016 and certainly since 2019 as shown in this figure. I think it's important to say that scientists still have a lot of trust with the public, but there's, there's no doubt it's declined during the pandemic. It's particularly declined among Republicans, but even with Democrats, we see a decline in the great deal of trust category. And this is concerning, right? As Warren Buffett put said, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. And we're gonna have to really claw ourselves out of this, which takes time, it takes engagement, and it takes a whole lot of uh, uh, boots on the ground work. Fourth reason why I think we've seen a resurgence in vaccine preventable diseases is that we need to recognize that there are bad actors out there. They are pushing this gap wider in a very deliberate manner. The anti-vax industry boasts an annual revenue of at least $36 million per year and is worth up to $1.1 billion. A lot of people don't realize that there are actually only four families that control nine or the four families that control 70% of the anti-vax conversation. The children's health def defense alone, uh, which is controlled by one family and happens, one guy happens to be running for president right now, was responsible for one in four misinformation tweets about COVID-19 vaccines. The most recent report uh, was actually published in the Washington Post last month that showed that the four major nonprofits that rose to prominence uh, during the coronavirus pandemic capitalized on the spread of medical misinformation and collectively they gained more than $118 million between 2020 and 2022. Fifth reason, I'm almost there guys, uh, of I think that this resurgence is happening um, is really taking a larger step back and looking at our larger landscape and how the culture is and the United States is evolving uh, and moving more towards individualism. And you can like that or not, but it is a huge problem for infectious diseases because infectious diseases um, violate the assumption of independence, right? What you do, what your neighbor does next to you directly impacts um, yourself and your health. And what do I mean by individualism or what am I starting to see that is, is reflective of this culture is while well, we're starting to see a rise in vaccine exemptions for those going to school. So historically, uh, we have medical reasons and non-medical reasons for exemptions. Um, only five states uh, do not allow non-medical exemptions. And so medical exemptions means you can't get the vaccine because of uh, medical problems the kid may have. Non-medical exemptions are those that are like religion or um, philosophical reasons. And 
We, while medical reasons, medical exemptions have remained relatively stable over the past 10 years, uh, those non-medical exemptions are starting to increase incredibly quickly um, with really no slowing down. We're also seeing that play, this role of individualism play out in policy. For example, the current measles outbreak in Florida, it's not actually a whole lot of cases. It turns out to be about nine cases, which is more than the average for an outbreak. But what made this unprecedented uh, this past couple of weeks was the Florida Surgeon General and the Department of Health said that um, unvaccinated didn't need to isolate, which is completely unprecedented. Right. And so we're, this is moving towards a choose your own adventure rather than using these standards of practice that were created based on decades of public health practice and science, which is very concerning to me. So to summarize, we're seeing these vaccine preventable diseases for a lot of reasons, right? Our information landscapes change. We've seen vaccine disruptions, loss of trust, bad actors individualism, as well as I think we need to recognize this idea of amnesia, that vaccines are a victim of their own success, right? The public doesn't really know how bad that measles is because we've had the privilege of not having to deal with it. And so we really need to um, ensure that th this amnesia is uh, attended to and educated and we answer people's questions. My biggest concern is all of these in conjunction with AI and in conjunction with climate change, which we're going to start seeing more and more um, diseases and more and more uh, risks and challenges in public health than that we've ever seen before. And so this leads me to the next big question is, what do we do about this? Um, how, what do we do in this time of extreme fatigue with vaccines, this loss of trust, this disinformation, politicization, and lack of public health funds, honestly, for education and outreach? Well, I think first, it's really important that people recognize that vaccine hesitancy is not a dichotomy, right? It's not pro-vax or anti-vax that uh, in fact, there's a spectrum of hesitancy. And I think that this is important because it means there isn't just one solution. For example, evidence shows that nothing more than mandates uh, really move the needle for this very small group of vaccine deniers. But I think it also puts into perspective, at least to me, who we should be targeting, right? Who we wanna have the most impact on and who we don't want to let slip um, further, further into vaccine refusers and um, vaccine deniers. But regardless of who and where people are on this spectrum, the thing that really works across, and this is really hard, is to have empathy. To recognize that what you say matters, how we communicate correct information matters especially to people that are hesitant and especially to people that um, are, are vaccine deniers. Because when we use words that like dumb or absurd or insane, all we're doing is challenging the worldview and they double down because their worldview is linked to their identity and the groups they're a part of. And we need to set new foundations of trust. And that starts with empathy. It also starts with being inclusive, um, make it our goal to break echo chambers. Johnson and colleagues did this fantastic analysis early in the pandemic 2020, where they looked about how information, particularly vaccine information spread on social media, On they looked at Facebook in particular. And there's a lot in their paper, but I wanted to focus on one figure in particular. Um, these blue dots are pro-vaccination Facebook pages. Those red dots are anti-vaccine. Um, Facebook pages. And these green dots are the undecided. And there's three things to recognize from this figure. One is that you can see there's a clear echo chamber, right? Blue is separated by red. I don't think that surprises anyone. Two, vaccine pages actually have fewer followers, but they have greater reach. They have far more sites. The third thing, and particularly the most important to me, is that 
Um, Anti-vaxxers are more often linked in discussions with other Facebook groups, um, such as parent associations. So in, in other words, these red dots are much more closer to those green dots than the blue is. So pages that explain the benefits of and the scientific case for vaccination are linked in a network that's largely disconnected from this main battlefield of sediment. We are talking to each other. Or we're not reaching out, we're not being responsive to the other narratives that are out there among the undecided, and this needs to change. Other than being empathetic, which sounds great, or um, uh, breaking echo chambers, uh, one way to do this is to equip trusted messengers. A trusted messenger isn't necessarily the ivory tower, right? No one's going to listen to Kate, Dr. Caitlin, not a lot of people are going to listen to Dr. Caitlin Jettelina or the CDC or the FDA especially those that have lost a lot of trust. Um, in fact, sometimes it's best that people don't get their information, but rather get them from uh, their trusted messengers. What do I mean by that? So one of the biggest eye-opening things about that I found during my newsletter was I always thought I was talking to Joe on the corner, but I, did, I wasn't. I, in fact, did a survey and realized I was talking to pastors. I was talking to education boards. I was talking to engineers at NASA. Um, and I was talking to uh, doctors and local health departments and all of the people that a lot of people trust. And so what I discovered was that um, we are all this node in this grassroots information diffusion network. And we really need to think about not necessarily top down uh, diffusion of information, but also top up diffusion of information. We need to identify who those trusted messengers are, for example, rural Americans, um, and then certainly equip them. So for example, uh, who are the trusted messengers right now? The great deal of people trust their doctors. Also trust state and local health, public health officials. And I think we really need to leverage this trust um, to start uh, moving the metrics on a, a lot of vaccine preventable diseases. Part of building trust is not only equipping trusted messengers, but really opening up a two-way street. As epidemiologists, as public health officials, as physicians, we've been doing a lot of telling and telling, but we really need to open up for this bi-directional relationship with the community. This means that the audience or our patients or our community is not merely a target, but they're an active participant. And what that means is that listening is different than hearing, right? Hearing is much easier because it's involuntary. There's really no conscious effort required, but we have to be far more alert. We have to have a conscious effort that requires this very focused involvement with who we're trying to reach. I think it's also important that opening up a two-way street recognizes that legitimate concerns do exist, that we have failed people in the past, that we not only need to listen to questions, but actively go look for questions. On social media, people are asking thousands a day in private messages, so much so that I actually had to create a database to understand what the question, the themes of the questions were coming in. Um, because a lot of my content on YLE, on my newsletter, 90% of it is not just what I think people are going to be interested in. It's responsive to the questions that I'm getting in. And then of course, uh, we need to meet people where they're at. Uh, and that is social media. And um, that is where people are getting their healthcare related information. Part of opening up a two-way street is also means being there and listening during non-emergency times or peace times, for example. So in public health, right, there's always a problem in the community. And, but we need, so we need to listen to the community to understand what their concerns are not ours, right, um, or not where our funding comes from. And I've seen this play out in many different forms, uh, particularly uh, on the heels of the pandemic, uh, that there's some public health departments do are continuing to do their town halls, right, shifting from COVID-19, but now looking at what is uh, the most important reason for that, oh, concern for them, whether it's opioids or um, bicycle accidents or uh, flooding in Marin County, it's, it, we need to let them um, come to us with the most important things on mind. And uh, I, 
I, I've seen some very creative ways that this has been set up. Another part of what we do um, is not just equipping trust and messengers, but also learning how to translate. People don't know what bivalent means, right? They don't know what myocarditis means, and they really shouldn't, but that doesn't mean they don't have a right to understand. As experts, as public health officials, we have a deep knowledge in particular subjects, and sometimes too much, right? So during the pandemic, and, and certainly now with other topics, what we're talking about seems to be apples, but what the public is hearing is oranges. And this disconnect is a major problem. Um, and like I said, uh, or one, one quote that really resonates with me is that if you can't explain it simply, you just don't understand it well enough, like Albert Einstein said. Like I said, experts, we know very deep knowledge about particular subjects. Um, but I would argue that this is sometimes too much knowledge, that we get really boggled down in the weeds. Um, and what I found in scientific communication is truly this art form that balances between nuance and readability. Um, and we're really never trained in this art form and that needs to be changed. Um, the best thing that I found that helps me is how do I talk to my sister, right? If I'm writing a post or if I'm putting out some, something on social media, how would I talk to it having a glass of wine with my sister? Um, this, this is what she really needs to know and this is how. Part of translating is also helping people figure out uh, where measles, for example, lies on our repertoire of threats. Risk communication is something that we do not do very well at all, um, particularly because it's really challenging, but this is something we need to get really much better at uh, because it can be very compelling. Um, and this is especially for new threats like COVID-19, but also uh, amnesia threats, like I was saying, like measles. Uh, so for example, this was a great graphic uh, from one of my SciComm colleagues this week, uh, which compared the risk of measles to other risks in our world. Would you fly with your kids if we recorded 90 fatal plane crashes per day? How about eating a large bag of Skittles if one was laced with cyanide? And so these risks are about the same risk that um, children and parents are gambling with if they don't get uh, vaccinated with the measles. Another example um, I try to do at least during the pandemic was micromorts, right? A measurement of one, of one in a million chance of dying. Um, and compared this to what is the risk of not getting vaccinated for COVID-19, particularly among those over 65. So what I found was that, for example, those unvaccinated over 65, the risk of dying from an Omicron infection was about as risky as one and a half years of heroin use. And so when we start comparing these risks of things we can't see with things that we're very familiar with, um, it gets a message very clearly out that I think we can do more of. Another example that I used back in the summer was um, how does air quality correspond to smoking cigarettes, right? There was this massive smoke um, from Canada and New York uh, in the Northeast during last summer. And we found that, you know, a purple quality, air quality index is equivalent to about half a pack of cigarettes a day if you're outside for the whole day. So um, we should be wearing masks and there's actions connected to this. Public health really needs to uh, be first, be proactive, and most importantly, anticipate concerns. Um, bring the public along for the ride. Public health organizations and officials and leadership must get comfortable communicating quickly, continuously, and with empathy. So for many organizations, this just means expanding or in fact, creating scientific communication workforce. Um, officials must recognize that communicating with the public is an essential part of our mission and energy and time and allocations. Something I've been discovering at my work at CDC and White House is that sometimes there are two great teams. There's a great comms team and there's great scientists. However, the bridge between the two are broken or completely dissolved. Also, the, the challenge with getting over that bridge can be very sobering um, due to clearance processes, for example, that need to be dramatically thinned. 
Um, these onerous clearance processes really discourage frequent information sharing and inadvertently eroding key messages. So um, in summary, uh, everything old is becoming new again. Um, I think that this is due to many factors are driving this, but there are a lot of things that we can do um, and that we should do. It will take a all hands on deck response um, in order to ensure that vaccine preventable diseases um, don't become uh, a, a reality going forward. So with that I wanted to open up for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Jalina, for your presentation. We do have a couple of questions here. Um, the first one is, do you believe that vaccine rates are lower in states that do not require a school nurse in their districts? Uh, and they followed up specifically in states that mandate, you know, vaccinations for schools. That is a great question. And now I don't know. I'm going to have to go look at the data um, because I think you're, I mean, I would assume the answer is yes. I mean, nurses, just like um, physicians, are a huge trusted messenger. Um, and they are in the weeds with students, um, especially those that don't have access to primary care. Um, and so I don't know. I'm going to write that down and look it up. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe I'll answer. I'll email you guys with an answer if I find one. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, there was another question: How exactly do anti-vaxxers profit off of misinformation? Is it through ads or clicks or some other way? Uh, wouldn't the for-profit world, especially big pharma, be motivated to outspend the anti-vaxxers when it comes to messaging? That's a great question as well. Um. There's a lot, there's quite a few reasons why anti-vax um, profit. It can be clicks. Um, so for example, the Children's Health Defense found an X percentage of increase, I'm not gonna make up the number, I don't remember it, of clicks to their website. A lot of the time those clicks um, then turn into revenue because of what is being sold on that site. So for example, supplements, I mean, we saw with ivermectin, with vitamin D, with COVID pandemic, um, with ways of boosting your immune system through supplements or um, ice baths, for example. So there, there's many different ways. I think also, I mean, uh, there's there's speaking engagements. I mean, there there's, during the pandemic, and there's always been an anti-vax rhetoric, right? It's, 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 as new as vaccines are. But I, what's interesting to see is how mainstream it's become, how much of the conversation it's become now. And that's what's certainly um, concerning for me. Uh, and so, so yeah, I mean, they make a, they make a huge profit off of it. Um, and it's, um, it's challenging. Now, I think the second part of the question is, wouldn't pharma find that profitable? Uh, I think so. I think the pharma um, makes far more than $118 million a year. Um, so it may just be a dime in their bucket. But I do think that this is a really great question for the larger atmos atmosphere of where does this, where does scientific communication belong? Um, if people don't trust in the government, they, you know, for profit has a uh, conflict of interest. Is this a, a nonprofit that we have to just get together and start? I mean, I think that um, there, there's certainly the economic case for it, but we need to get our eggs in a row and, and start and start moving on it. Yeah, your, your uh, sentiments about a trusted messenger is, is a good one for sure. <laughs> Um, there was another question. Can you discuss the role and responsibility of social media companies in controlling the flow of deliberate misinformation? This is such a hard question, particularly because this question is at the Supreme Court right now. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. Like, I, I think that there is some role that social media plays. I mean, we've seen it play out on how Twitter just changed all of their settings, right? And it's um, it, it certainly has an impact. I think that though there's 
quite a lot of evidence showing that this game of whack-a-mole that we play on social media is um, always a reactive approach, um, that actually the most effective intervention we have against misinformation is actually called pre-bunking. It's teaching people how, how do they um, identify misinformation and disinformation on social media or the news. Um, regardless of what the topic is, because we're not going to win in this game of whack-a-mole. We have to be a whole lot smarter. Um, so yeah, I think that there's a role that fact checkers have. I think that there is a role that social media has, particularly in creating these echo chambers. But I do think that we can't blame it all on that, that we there are other tools and other levers that we need to really engage with, which is a harder harder thing to do. <laughs> Great answer. All right, do you, we'll have time for a few more here. Um, can you talk about the best way to message what VARES means and doesn't mean? I think that's something confused by the public quite a lot. Oh yeah, um, I have a whole post on this on why I I wish I could just pull it up. But um, yeah, I, I, the way I, I tell people is that we have, there's these things called passive surveillance systems, right? And passive surveillance means that it requires people to report to it. Um, and that means that there's biases and that means that um, sometimes there are bad players that uh, put information there um, purposefully. Uh, and I think that it's just really one tool that one tool, but also an important tool to find safety signals. I was really happy during the pandemic that we created other surveillance systems like ZSAFE, which was more active surveillance, as well as these hospital databases to show safety of vaccines. And so what I tell people is it's just one piece of the puzzle that VAERS um, actually helped us a lot during the pandemic. It found myocarditis one month after the adolescent vaccine rollout. It found um, thrombosis after J&J &J vaccines. Um, but to take it with a grain of salt, because it's not certainly not the whole picture. Thank you. Um, all right, here's a good one. Uh, how can we as pediatric providers, nurses, healthcare workers, use social media well and not continue to worsen the echo chamber? Yeah, so I think first of all is um, start using social media, um, really leverage that voice. The challenge though is, which I very much hear, is capacity, um, right? If you are seeing X patients a day, who really has time to one, listen, to two, respond, and three, just create content for social media. Um, and I hear that. I think that the answer to capacity is innovation. Um, there's been quite a few tools that are being created right now. One is, for example, Arclet. There's another couple ones that um, leverage AI um, and they leverage uh, new programs that help create content for pediatricians, for example, that not only helps them um, target their audience, for example, right? We don't want to beach in the background of a vaccine post if it's, you know, North Dakota. But um, so making it more relevant, but also making it responsive to the needs of their patient population. Um, and that, that capacity building, I think, is a key step in here. I also want to recognize and, and say that, you know, sometimes this isn't what people want to do. And I think that's OK. I think what we need to do is equip those that do find a calling for reaching out on social media and helping protect them while they do so. Absolutely. Um, all right, uh, here's a comment. Agree with the need to translate complexity. What are areas where we are disconnecting? Can you give examples where we are saying apples and the public is hearing oranges? Yeah, good question. I mean, there was a lot of examples during the pandemic. Um, I think one great example happened this last week with isolation guidance that saying that, hey, a lot of people are saying that we dropped isolation guidance when 
the public is hearing that we dropped isolation guidance when in reality, that's not what CDC is saying. And um, I think the, the reasons for why are incredibly important. I think the other um, apples to oranges great example is risk differences. Um, and what is a risk for those that with oranges um, and what are we saying with these apples? So for example, the RSV vaccine recently just showed that um, there's a safety signal. Uh, a lot of people are worried about that safety signal, but they should be hearing that this vaccine has more benefits than harms. And so there's a lot of, I think, nuance in making those apples and oranges look a little more um, uh, similar. One big thing that I have learned is to not underestimate the public, that they actually are very curious about what an mRNA vaccine does, um, and uh, we should be able to find answers for them. Great answer. Um, okay, this is probably relevant to where we are. How would you address American Indians, Alaskan Natives on the importance of vaccination while being culturally sensitive? Yeah, I mean, I think this is um, with any vulnerable group, it's uh, it's stakeholder engagement, honestly. Um, it's, uh, again, equipping those trusted messengers, having conversations about one, understanding what the epi data is showing, right? That there are low vaccination rates, but also bringing in this, not just the quantitative data, but that qualitative context, right? How is the best way to reach that population? What are the misconceptions? How can we target them more directly? Use them as a partner in this um, rather than coming down from the ivory tower and telling. I think that stakeholder engagement is absolutely key um, for really any of these conversations and any population that we're trying to target. My biggest concern is um, uh, what we call helicoptering in when there's a problem and then helicoptering out and that that loses trust right away. And um, uh, certainly we need a better approach. Okay, thank you for taking so many questions. Maybe we'll do one more here, if that's okay. You have one more in you? Yeah, let's do it. Um, okay, uh, concomitant with the rise of individualism that you aptly noted, we heard frequently that mandates, so like mass mandates, vaccine mandates, et cetera, were particularly onerous to many individuals during the pandemic. State legislatures are now reviewing uh, public health authority to issue these in many states. As you noted, mandates can move the needle on the most resistance, but do you think it comes at too much of a cost in trust? And when and where should we consider mandates as a public health tool? Oh boy. Just a light one. <laughs> That's a, I mean, it's a great question. And I think it's the debate, the huge debate right now within public health is where, um, I, I, where do the benefits outweigh the risks? Um, and I think it de depends on the virus. It depends on um, our goals and a community. Um, I do think that vaccine mandates very much hurt trust during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, particularly, and the benefits weren't that large either, right? Vaccinated can spread the virus. Um, they can't, every, I mean, vaccinated and, and those recently infected are very similar. That is very different than, for example, measles, where vaccines stop transmission, um, had has been eliminated in our community, it's not spreading. Um, and so I think that public health really needs to think carefully, especially given this landscape of when we use those levers and why and how, uh, because it is a very, um, it's a very sensitive topic um, and you get culture and values um, inserted into this. Um, and ultimately health policy isn't just based on science, it's based on philosophy, it's based on, again, values, culture, psychology, politics, all of it. So um, all of that to say, I don't know, <laughs> but I, I do think that it's a really important conversation to have um, and a nuanced conversation is certainly needed uh going forward 
Thank you for that thoughtful answer. And thank you for hanging in there with us. We would just really like to thank Dr. Jadalina for an incredible presentation and Q&A session here today. Again, for those seeking one credit of CE, please follow the link provided in that chat to take the post-test and evaluation. This must be completed to acquire credit. And a reminder that a recording of this webinar will be available on the NDSU Siri YouTube channel. Thank you all for joining us today.